In this lesson, we are going to look at some proofs of theorems on integers. Here are some known results on divisibility. Number one, let a and b be non-zero integers. If a divides b, then the absolute value of a is less than or equal to the absolute value of b. Take note that we have the absolute value sign here because a and b can be negative. If we consider the case when a and b are positive, and a divides b, then definitely a has to be less than or equal to b. Let us prove this. I will no longer write the premise let a and b be non-zero integers. We will just start with the premise that a divides b. Then there exists an integer k such that b is equal to a k. Since b is not equal to zero, k here must be non-zero, so therefore its absolute value is greater than or equal to 1. k is an integer. Hence, if we get the absolute value of the above equation, we get that the absolute value of b is equal to the absolute value of a k, which is equal to the absolute value of a times the absolute value of k, and this is greater than or equal to the absolute value of a, because the absolute value of k is greater than or equal to 1. Next, number 2. Let a and b again be non-zero integers. If a divides b and b divides a, then a is equal to plus or minus b. So for the proof, I will no longer write this down. I will just start with the premise here. But strictly speaking, you should write that. Suppose a divides b and b divides a then. By result number 1, from here, the absolute value of a is less than or equal to the absolute value of b. And from the fact that b divides a, the absolute value of b must be less than or equal to the absolute value of a. And if you look at this inequality now, what do we get from there? get that the absolute value of b must be the same as the absolute value of a. And so, a is equal to plus or minus b. Next, number three, if we have a non-zero integer, there are only finitely many integers that divide it. So, meaning to say there are only finitely many divisors of a given integer. So for the proof, we start with the premise, let b be an integer with b not equal to 0. By result 1, the set of all divisors of b is a subset of this set. Absolute value of negative b, and then absolute value of negative b plus 1, and so on until the absolute value of b. And this set is a finite set and therefore its subset will also be finite. Next, let us discuss common divisors. Suppose that we have four non-zero integers. We say that C is a common divisor of A and B if C divides A and C divides B. We say that D is the greatest common divisor of A and B and we write it as follows. D is equal to the GCD of A and B whenever both of these conditions are satisfied. First, D is a common divisor of A and B. That takes care of common divisor. For the second condition, every common divisor of A and B should be less than or equal to D. So that takes care of the word greatest. So take note that the GCD of A and B is the same as the GCD of B and A. The order does not matter. And the GCD of AB is the same as the GCD of their absolute values. Next, let's talk about linear combinations. Suppose that we have two integers and let's call them A and B. An integer of this form AM plus BN for some integers M and N is called a linear combination of a and b. So for example, 1 here is a linear combination of 3 and 7 because there are integers that you can multiply to 3 and 7 such that when you add this, you get 1. So this one is saying that 3 
is a linear combination of 12 and 15. The next result is saying that if an integer divides a and b, then it also divides every linear combination of a and b. So for example, we know that 2 divides 12 and, and 2 divides 6. If we now get any linear combination of 12 and 6, let's say 12 times 1 plus 6 times 2, 2 will also divide that. Yes, this is true. This is 12 plus 12, 24. Since the GCD of A and B is a common divisor of A and B, it just so happens that it is the greatest, then it will also divide every linear combination of A and B. We are proving an implication. C is a common divisor of A and B. So that is C divides A and C divides B. Then you want to show that C divides AM plus BN for all integers. Mn. This is what we want to prove. So therefore, we start with suppose C divides A and C divides B. Thus, A is equal to CK and B is equal to CL for some integers K and L. Now take note what we want to prove here. We want to show that for all Mn and Z, C divides AM plus BN. So therefore, we have let, because we have a universal quantifier here. Let M, N, B, N, Z. And then we will now consider this A, M plus B, N here. We want to write it in the end as C times an integer. How do we achieve that? We just substitute A equals CK and B equals CL here. This is CKM plus CLNN. -N. Therefore, that is C times quantity KM plus LN. KM plus LN is an integer because KM, LN, and N are all integers. So, therefore, C divides AM plus BN and that concludes this one. There is no need to prove this one because it automatically follows from the second sentence. This is the big theorem that we want to prove in this lesson. Let a and b be integers, not both zero. The smallest positive linear combination of a and b is the GCD of a and b. In order to prove this theorem, I will divide the proof into three parts. For the first part, we will show that the smallest positive linear combination of A and B exists in the first place. If you have two integers, A and B not both zero, we are always assured that the smallest positive linear combination will exist. And we will call it D. Next, we want to show that it is the GCD. We will just show that it divides A and B. And lastly, among all the common divisors of A and B, D is the greatest. Before I give the proof of this theorem, let me just give an illustration of this. For example, the GCD of 3 and 7 is equal to 1, and 1 can be written as a linear combination of 3 and 7. What is that? That's 3 times negative 2 plus 7 times 1. What else? For example, GCD of 12 and 15 is equal to 3. The theorem is saying that we can write 3 as a linear combination of 12 and 15. How is that? 3 is equal to 12 times negative 1 plus 15 times 1. Let us now prove the theorem. For the first part, we want to show the existence of D. We start our proof by... Assuming that a and b are integers which are not both zero, that takes care of this hypothesis here. Next, we consider the set of all positive integers that are linear combinations of a and b. 
So look at the form AS plus BT. These are linear combinations of A and B where S and T are integers. And of course, we have the condition here that they must be positive. We will use the well-ordering principle to show that S has a smallest element. What are the conditions that must be satisfied by a set in the well-ordering principle? First, that set has to be non-empty. How do you show that a set is non-empty? All you have to do is to get at least one element of S. What would be an element of S? We take S to be A and T to be B. We have AA times BB. What can you say about this one? A squared plus B squared. This is strictly greater than zero. Why is this strictly greater than zero? Because A and B are not both zero. Hence, A squared plus B squared is an element of S. And therefore, S is not empty. Moreover, S is a subset of the set of natural numbers. These two are the conditions that must be satisfied by a set in the well-ordering principle for us to say that it has a smallest element. So thus, by the well-ordering principle, S has a smallest element and let's call it D. Next, we will now show that this D that we obtained here is a common divisor of A and B. This is the same sentence that I ended with in the last slide. So thus, there exist integers m and n such that d is equal to am plus bm. That is, this is just saying that d is a linear combination of a and b. What is our goal here? This is not included in the proof. We want to show that d divides a and D divides B. Now, the common technique when you want to show that an integer divides another integer is to use the division algorithm and show that the remainder has to be zero. So I will do that for the first one. So by DA, that's division algorithm, there exists integers Q and R such that A is equal to DQ plus r, where r is greater than or equal to 0, but strictly less than, what is our divisor here? d. I will just solve for r here. We have r is equal to a minus dq. Why am I solving for r here? Because I want to show that r is equal to 0, so that we will just be left with a is equal to dq. I will replace D by AM plus BN. And this is now equal to A minus AM. So that's A times 1 minus M plus B times negative N. Why did I factor out A and B? Because I wanted to show that R is a linear combination of A and B. However, we have that R is greater than or equal to 0 and less than D. However, R is greater than or equal to 0, less than D. And D is the smallest positive linear combination of A and B. We cannot have that. R is strictly greater than 0 and less than D because that will contradict the fact that D is the smallest positive linear combination of A and B. So therefore, what must be true? We should have R to be equal to 0. This implies that R is equal to 0 and so we have that A is equal to DQ which means that D divides A. Similarly, when I say similarly, it means that the proof is very much the same as this one, except that we will replace A by B. So therefore, we have now shown that the smallest positive linear combination of A and B, which is D, is a common divisor of A and B. For the last part of the proof, 
it remains to show that every common divisor of a and b is less than or equal to b. In symbols, what does this mean? It means that if c divides a and c divides b, then c is less than or equal to d. This is what we want to show. So therefore, we start with suppose c is an integer such that c divides a and c divides b. Remember that d is a linear combination of a and b. And from this result, it must divide d. And therefore, since c divides d, c must be less than or equal to d. Take note that I no longer need the absolute value sign here because we already know that d is positive. So that takes care of this part. We now know that among all the common divisors of a and b, d is the greatest. Therefore, we have just shown that d is now the greatest common divisor of a and b. That concludes our proof. Here is an alternative definition for GCD, although of course this is a theorem, but sometimes for other books, this is what they use as a definition. But it just turns out that this is just equivalent with the definition, so that's why it really doesn't matter. Anyway, suppose that A and B are two non-zero integers. D is the GCD of A and B if and only if D is a positive integer that satisfies the following two conditions. Number one, D is a common divisor of A and B. This is just the same as the definition that we had earlier, but the only different thing is this condition two. If C is a common divisor of A and B, then C divides D. This is actually better than the original definition here. In our original definition, we only have that every common divisor of C is less than or equal to D. Of course, this makes sense because we have the word greatest common divisor. But this statement here will give us something to work with because we now know that a common divisor will not just be less than or equal to D. It will actually divide your GCD. For example, we have for 18 and 24, the GCD of 18 and 24 is 6. What are the common divisors of 18 and 24? Of course, we have 1, 2, 3, 6, and their negatives. So as you can see, all of these numbers divide the GCD, which is 6. Since this is an if and only if statement, we have to prove two directions. First, we will prove that if D is the GCD, then these two are satisfied. Hence, we have this. Suppose that D is equal to the GCD of A and B. We will show that D satisfies these two conditions. By definition of GCD, D satisfies 1. D is a common divisor of A and B. We only have to show two. In order to show two, we want to prove this implication. So we assume that C divides A and B and then show that C divides D. Our goal here is to show that C divides D. By our previous result, we can write D as a linear combination of A and B. That is, there exist integers M and N such that D is equal to AM plus BN. Remember, what do we want to end up with? We want to show that D is equal to C times an integer. How will we get a C here? From the fact that C divides A and C divides B. So we have here that since a, C divides A and C divides B, a is equal to CK and B is equal to CL for some integers K and L. Plugging this in equation 1, we now get that D is equal to CKM plus CLN, which is equal to C times quantity KM plus 
ln. Thus, c divides d. That is what we want to show. For the other direction, suppose that 1 and 2 hold. It only suffices to show that every common divisor of a and b is less than or equal to d. Again, this is our premise. We want to show that d is the GCD. From the definition here, this is already condition 1, right? All we have to do is to show that every common divisor of a and b is less than or equal to d. So since this is what we want to show, what is this? If c divides a and c divides b, then c is less than or equal to t. That is what we want to show. Therefore, we start with suppose c divides a and c divides b. However, we are assuming here that 1 and 2 hold by 2. If we have a common divisor, then c divides d. By condition 2, c divides d. Since c already divides d, we now know that c is less than or equal to d. This is one of the few results that we obtained in the first slide. And that concludes our proof. We were able to prove both directions. Next, we will study relatively prime numbers. Two non-zero integers, a and b, are said to be relatively prime or co-prime whenever their GCD is equal to 1. For example, 3 and 5 are relatively prime. 1 is the only common divisor of 3 and 5. 15 and 22 are relatively prime. Whereas 15 and 36 are not relatively prime because their GCD is equal to 3. Take note that two numbers can be relatively prime even though they are both composite. Because look at our example here. 15 here is composite. 22 is composite. But if you look at them together, they are relatively prime. For this one, 3 and 5, both of them are prime. If P1 and P2 are two distinct primes, automatically they are relatively prime because they share no common factor. However, the second example shows that you can have two composite numbers, but they are relatively prime. Here are some results on relatively prime numbers. Suppose that we have non-zero integers, a and b, and they are relatively prime. Prove that any integer c can be written as a linear combination of a and b. This part here is saying that for all c in z, there exist integers mn such that c is equal to am plus bn. That is what we want to prove in symbols. So I already have the hypothesis here that a and b be non-zero integers that are relatively prime. How do we start our proof? We have to start with let c be an integer. And then we want to show that C, this part here is just saying that C can be written as a linear combination of A and B. How will we do this? We only know that A and B are relatively prime. So since they are relatively prime, their GCD is equal to 1. But according to the big theorem that we just proved, the GCD of two numbers can always be written as a linear combination of the two numbers. So we have that 1 is equal to AS plus BT for some integers S and T. Now, do you already see how can we get C as a linear combination of A and B? All we have to do is multiply c to both sides. We get c equals a s c plus b t c. And there you go. So we have therefore c is a linear combination of a and b. That concludes our proof.
Now, the proof of this theorem gives us an idea of how to express any integer C as a linear combination of A and B. The proof tells us that as long as we know how to write 1 as a linear combination of the two integers A and B, then we will be able to write C as a linear combination of these two integers. For example, let's just have small numbers. The GCD of 3 and 5 is equal to 1. And then write, let's say, 7 as a linear combination of 3 and 5. We will start with writing 1 as a linear combination of 3 and 5. What is that? This is 3 times 2 plus 5 times negative 1. And therefore, since we want to have 7, this is simply 3 times 7 times 2 plus 5 times 7 times negative 1. I will end this video lesson with two theorems, two big theorems on rel regarding relatively prime numbers. First, suppose that we have three integers, a, b, and c, where a is non-zero. If a divides b, c, and the GCD of A and B is equal to 1, then A divides C. Well, just to illustrate this result before we proceed with the proof, for example, let us consider A and B to be 3 and 2. 3 divides 12, which can be written as 2 times 6. 3 divides 12 and 3 divides 6. That is true. However, if the GCD is no longer equal to 1, for example, 4 and 4. The GCD is 4, of course. 4 divides 40, which is 4 times 10. It is not true that 4 divides 10. Let us start with the proof of this one. Of course, we will start with our hypothesis here. Let A, B, and C be integers with A not equal to 0. We are Proving this implication, A divides BC and GCD of AB is equal to 1, then A divides C. So therefore, we assume our premise. Suppose that A divides BC and the GCD of AB is equal to 1. What is our goal? We want to show that A divides C. Since we want to write C as A times an integer, how will we do that? We will start with the fact that GCD of A and B is equal to 1. The GCD is equal to 1. We can write 1 as a linear combination of A and B. Then just like what we did in previous slides, we will multiply both sides by C to get AMC plus B and C. I already have A here. But what about this one? I still do not have A. This is where we will use the fact that A divides BC because we have BC here. So since A divides BC, BC can be written as AK for some integer K. Thus, if we plug this in here, we get that C is equal to AMC. This is BC, so that's AK, AKN, and there you go. You can now factor out A to get A times quantity MC plus KN. Therefore, A divides C. Next, we have Euclid's lemma. Euclid's lemma says that if a prime number divides a product of two numbers, then P divides at least one of the factors. So take note again that this only works if P is prime. For the proof, we start with let A, B, and P be integers. We are proving an implication of the form P, then we have OR, Q, OR, R. How do we prove a statement of this form? Take note that our premise is just small p is prime and small p divides A, B. Take note that this is equivalent in the statement P and not Q, then R. Again, what is this saying? When you want to prove 
an implication where the conclusion is a disjunction, what you can do is to suppose the negation of one of the statements. So in this case, I supposed Q is not true and then show that the other one must be true. So I have this premise if P is prime and P divides AB. I want to show that P divides A or P divides B. So therefore, I will now assume that P does not divide A. We will now show that P must divide B. Now take note that P is a prime number and A is an integer. Since P is prime, A and P will not share any common factor except 1. The only divisors of P are P and 1. Just to illustrate this further, if you have a prime number, the only possibility for the GCD of A and P is P or 1. But in this case, if the GCD of A and P is equal to P, this is saying now that P divides A. This scenario cannot happen because we assume that P does not divide A. So therefore, we are left with GCD of A and P being equal to 1. Since we know that P and A are relatively prime from our previous theorem, this one, what is this saying again? If A divides B, C, and these two are relatively prime, then A must divide C. So in this case, we have that P and A are relatively prime, so therefore, P must divide B. That concludes our proof.